elite sellers know how to self-source pipeline. They don't rely on marketing. They don't rely on others. They do it themselves. I've, it's been that way for me in my whole career. And I think a lot of the success I've had came from the fact that I could just pick up the phone and call. I don't need anybody's permission or help to do that. That's Bilal Patrawi, founder of learn to sellio and the creator of dev to fluff He personally closed five plus million in sales through cold calling. He's a top one FM LinkedIn sales star and a Salesforce top sales influencer. In this episode, we are going to talk about how to redefine your mindset with cold calling, how to get prospect talking on cold calls, and how to establish credibility and authority during a cold course. So Bilal, super curious to understand how can Sales rep redefine their mindset to take control of a cold call. Yeah, well, I appreciate asking. Thanks for having me, by the way. It's an honor uh, to be on the show and join you. Um, so I, I've done a lot of cold calling, like you mentioned. So a lot of the startups that I was at were 100% outbound. Four of the seven startups that I've been a part of were 100% outbound. So we had zero marketing, zero um, brand, or even, and, and obviously no inbound. So it really was starting from scratch. And I'll say this about outbound, which what, what the mistake that I make that I think a lot of sellers make is that they don't understand what the purpose of outbound is. So we get focused on meetings. Like I need to set meetings. Okay. But, but there's so much more going on in outbound than just a meeting. A meeting is just one of many successful outcomes you could have. You could have an internal referral, right? So you get the right company, right problem, wrong person. They say, we need to speak to so-and-so. It's a great outcome still. You could get a, a really strong follow-up, right? Right company, right person, wrong time. And you just need to catch them when it is the right time. You could have a disqualification, which people don't understand the value of that. The ability to get rid of something is beautiful because you can't get your time back. So chasing something that was never really an opportunity is, is some cost by definition. So disqualification is a great thing when you start, especially in a startup, when you don't know what the right answer is. You know, you haven't figured that out. What is our ICP? Who is our ideal buyer? Who is it? What do we want to sell to them exactly? You just still don't know those questions or you don't have the answers to those questions yet. Being able to disqualify early and quickly is, is beautiful, is a thing of, of pure gold. So it's that kind of mentality of understanding that I'm not cold calling to persuade people or just to book meetings. I'm cold calling to make progression on a list, to make progression with some buyers. And that might look like different things in just a meeting set. And if I can get the meetings, right, perfect. But if I can't, for whatever reason, I'm still making progress with these other outcomes. When I started to train and coach SDRs uh, two, three years ago, a lot of SDRs, they were like, not complaining about making cold calls, but they were only seeing cold calls as booking meetings. And the way we are talking about cold calling was like you are explaining here, I think you, you, you gave more details, but also another way to think about calling, you can still gather some information, for example, about the account that you can still leverage in your outreach. And like you said, call calling is not just booking meeting, but like making progress. I think I like that, the way you, you said that. It's a big shift. It's a big shift to just, you know what else it does, Elric, is that it lowers the bar of expectations. I, I think when you put too high of expectations on outbound in general, let, let's just be frank, outbound is an ineffective channel for most people. For most people, outbound is also one of those things where it could be a colossal waste of time. It could also be a, a, a proper channel. And the line is very thin between those two. There's not like a lot of middle ground. It's, it's usually one or the other. So when you, when you lower the expectations and realize a lot of my outbound might get ignored, but the point is I wasn't trying to get a meeting necessarily. What I was trying to do was maybe build some market presence, was try to define my ICP was again, build a list of quality follow-ups that in six months time will turn into pipeline. All those sort of things now, now lowers the expectation. I go, okay, I'm making progress. I might not be getting a meeting today, but I'm making progress to a bigger goal that I need to hit in three months, six months, 12 months time. Yeah, and to go back on what you mentioned also before uh, talking about cold calling specifically, I think uh, you are talking about you are working with companies with no brand um, and so no inbound also. And something a lot of people are forgetting when you call call is they don't have, um, sometimes like you were mentioning about your previous roles was your prospect don't have familiarity with your one, your company or your product. So you need to build this familiarity. And that's why call call is a great way to do that actually. It is. We'd love to, to understand how you break down 
the, the script or maybe if I'm not maybe the script, but the, the framework you use for uh, having effective cold calls. Okay. So I call it the mic drop method and it was born from watching other elite sellers cold call effectively. And I noticed time and again, one single thing that they did that none of the others did, which is they got their buyers talking early and they got them talking often. And I noticed successful cold calls have a very strong correlation to how quickly you can get the buyer speaking and how much you can involve them in the conversation. Otherwise, it becomes a monologue. Monologues get shut down. They lead to failed outcomes, right? Hangups and things of that nature. So I was like, okay, how do you, how do, you do it? What's the fastest way to get your buyer speaking? So when you think about it, Every successful cold call has four parts. Yep. The first five seconds, the next 15 to 30, the next one to eight minutes, and then the close. If you're missing one of those four, you won't reach a successful outcome, right? The call is going to end somewhere where you don't want it to, an undesirable outcome. So that's the mic drop method in a nutshell is realizing there's four parts to the call. If you make these successful transitions, you'll have successful outcomes consistently. And now it's a question of what do we do in those four transition points? How do we make progress consistently in them? And then diagnose where we're maybe making mistakes or losing people. So I call it permission, problem, provoke, promise. So four Ps. And that's the mic drop method of using those four Ps to navigate the four transition points of a cold call. You said pro uh, permission, problem. What was the third one? Provoke and then promise. But when you say permission, are you talking about? Yeah, the permission based opener, something like that. Now, these can go all over the place. And I'll say this the one that I teach and the one that I prefer is Hey, Elric, you're not expecting my call. Do you have a moment? I promise to be brief. Yep. Or, Hey, Elric, this is a cold call. You want to roll the dice? I don't say you want to hang up now or roll the dice. I don't like, I like putting anything that lowers my status with the buyer. But I'm fine with acknowledging the fact that, hey, I know I'm interrupting your day. I don't know what's going on. You know, like, were you expecting a call from the hospital? Were you truly actually in a meeting and thought this was an important call? So I want to just embrace that reality in the beginning and just give them a chance to opt out if they do want to opt out. Because I'm not interested in trying to talk to somebody that doesn't want to speak. Yeah, because you can obviously find move forward with the conversation, but they were not listening to what you are saying. So you want to know that at the beginning. So do you introduce yourself in the, in those five seconds? I will say my name. I might say my company, depending if my company has some sort of brand or not. But as soon as they say, yeah, or they say, well, who is this? Or what's this in regards to? Then I definitely will say, okay, well, this is Bilal at Trinet. And I will say my name and company at that point. So I, I mix it up sometimes. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. It just depends on, the buyer and how receptive they are to me just being kind of direct or not. And so let's say they, they say, yes, I have five minutes. What do you say next? Right. So now we got to get to the problem. So what I realized is going back to the mic drop method and why I teach the problem statement. The number one way that I can get somebody talking to me, the way I can earn. So that five second mark just earned me the next 20 seconds. But here's the problem. Spotlight's on me. All the pressure's on me now, right? I'm on stage, spotlight, holding the microphone, sweating. You know, I better say something good. What's the thing that we could say that gets the microphone out of our hands and gives it to the buyer, right? Like how fast can we pass that mic? So in my mind, after seeing so many thousands of cold calls and doing thousands myself, if I can state a problem better than my buyer can state it, I get their attention immediately. How can I state a problem better than they themselves can state it? So I'll give you an example. I used to sell um, payroll and HR. So this is my problem statement. I know for most CFOs of small businesses like yours that your second largest cost after payroll is health benefits, which have been rising 9 to 15% year over year. How are you handling your second largest cost rising that much? It's like, wow, it's a really thoughtful question. Okay, he identified that I'm a small business owner. He identified that he knows my largest cost is payroll. He identified my second largest cost. And yeah, it has been rising a lot. You can accomplish a lot. By saying a really well thought out problem statement, where do we find that problem statement that will get your buyer's attention? That makes you sound informed and credible and watch the, watch the reaction because people are expecting a pitch. They're thinking, oh, here we go. It's a seller. Go ahead, vomit your pitch on me. Tell me what you do. And you're not going to do that. You're going to say something about them. 
And you're going to give them a chance to either embrace that problem or reject it. They might say, no, I don't have that problem. Our health benefits haven't risen 9 to 15% year over year. Oh, great. Congrats. Hey, most people I talk to have, you're an exception. What are you doing? I, I, I'd love to learn. Or they say, yeah, that is a problem, right? So you give them a chance to either embrace the problem or reject it instead of objecting to a pitch, which is so easy to do. Hey, we're the number one provider of payroll in the country, but I'm not interested. Thank you. Oh, what are you not interested? You know, and now all of a sudden you're backpedaling, trying to defend your pitch. It's a terrible spot to be in. So mic drop method. How do we get the mic out of our hands and into the buyer? A really well thought out problem statement with a question that provokes dial. Let's talk about this. Yes, because that's the main, I would say, challenge that sometimes you find is as you can't talk to a C-level executive, for example, but because right now you are talking about the, SM, uh, the CFO, a small business. But how do you find this problem? Um, do you do like some research? Uh, how is it like, for example, the case study from the company and then you, you start testing this uh, with your, your prospects or what was your process? That? There's a couple of places to look for problems. So number one is job descriptions. If I look at the job description of my ideal buyer and I see a repeating message about fixing this, handling that, growing this, building that, whatever the action line is, that gives me an idea what they're responsible for. So that's always a good spot to start looking. Another really good spot is reviews, online reviews, G2, Trust Radius, these sort of services. Let me look at reviews and see what, pe what people are saying. Why did they buy the product? What were they trying to solve? Did they actually solve it? What did they like? What did they not like? That's going to give me some ideas too. Sometimes it could be Directly something you know that your buyer has to deal. Like I'll give you another example. One, in one of the uh, mic drop scripts that I made for uh, a company that I was uh, advising, they called wealth advisors. So mostly the wealth advisors use tools. They're, they're tools people. They get it. They know that they need tools to run their business. We would just list the name of our competitors right in the first 30 seconds. We'd be like, hey, I know most, most wealth advisors use uh, are cobbled together tools like Riskalyze, Hidden Levers, and Totem to make risk profiles. So right away, we just listed our top three competitors. Sometimes you just do that. It could just be very direct. And we would say, uh, what's your experience using those tools? And they just go right away. I hate Riskalyze. Or yeah, I just switched to Totem. Or you know what? Yeah, I, I've been using Levers for a while now. So <clears throat> you have to test it. You're right. Well, typically what would happen is we would identify one or two really strong problem statements and get on the phone and start testing them. And the way you know you found your winner, the way you know you found the one that works is talk time goes up and objections go down. When you've got the right mic drop question, you see it. All of a sudden, I'm not interested disappears and conversation and talk time starts going through the roof. Follow-up question on what you just mentioned. You are talking about competitors, and then we are talking about problem statement, for example. So competitors, I imagine you ask about competitors if you are like in a mature market, I would say, uh, versus like a new product that no one is using, for example, because you are talking about Trinet earlier. Uh, you you might want to focus more on the problem they might have instead of talking for, because if they might... They, they want to have maybe a competitor. So that's the, the thought process behind that? Or? Yeah, exactly. Like, let's say you and I were selling payroll. Almost all the companies we speak to already have a payroll provider, right? Otherwise, they wouldn't be in business. So there's no reason to pretend they don't have a payroll provider. Let's just lead straight in with that, right? Why, why pretend like they don't have one? Let's just say, I know you have a payroll provider. Most companies like yours use an ADP or Paychex. And I'm wondering, how's it going? Right, so you could just yeah. be very direct because you already know versus if I'm selling like a new startup and it's a new kind of product and they might not have it. I might want to tackle the problem that, that they don't even realize they have, or maybe they realize they have, but didn't realize there's a solution for and start there. So it just, it does depend. And that's why you have to test. And I tell people it's a framework. So the mic drop method is a framework to guide your conversations. It's not a script. You actually then have to think and use your, apply kind of your, your knowledge of your buyer to make it work for you. But the idea is you're handling those transitions. So we know we did it correctly because we, we essentially navigate that, that 15 to 20 second mark. And now we get into one to eight minutes of dialogue. They answer. 
And now all of a sudden it's like, cool, now I'm having a conversation with my buyer. And now it's a question of where do I want to take this conversation? Now, that was the problem section uh, of the call. We were talking about the competitor, for example. How do you provoke on talking about the competitor? Do you focus on how you are different? Or how do you focus on asking their feedback about how they're using it? Or what's your, your process? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a really great question. And, and this, I'll, I'll say this to your viewers because I wish somebody told me this earlier in my sales career. You will never, ever lower your status with a buyer by being informed. It just, it's not possible. Never. So if they do have a competitor, you should know about that competitor. You should have an idea how they price, how their product works, how they position themselves. And you should be the one to bring that up. Oh, you do use paychecks? Yeah, I'm familiar with them. Are you on their $150 pro plan, the one where they do the accounting for you? Oh, yeah, I'm familiar with that too. What's been your experience then with year-end compliance? Like you should already know that. And, and when you do that, people find you so credible because they're like, okay, I'm not talking to somebody that's fishing for information here. This is clearly somebody that does this regularly. So you, you, you have to display that credibility. That's why you lead with a problem statement instead of a pitch. Yep. And you, when you get the answer, you continue the conversation, right? Don't grab the mic back once you gave it to them. That's the worst thing you do, right? We, we, we were on center stage. They said, who is this? What is this about? You're holding the mic. You're sweating. You land your problem statement. You give them the microphone. You don't want to really grab it right back and start yeah. dogging again. You got to... Let them hold the mic a bit. So you tell them, yeah, I, I'm familiar with that. What do you think of it? You know, I, I, oh, I know about that. So here's what I know. What, what's your thoughts? And you, and you give it back, right? Let them hold that microphone and let them talk. Because we said successful cold calls are typically a dialogue. And the sooner you get your buyer talking and the more you get them speaking, the more likely you're going to get a positive outcome at the end of the call. What's your experience with them? So what are you trying to, for, to get here? Are you, do you want to see if they're happy, for, happy with the solution? Or do you want to get some information if they are not happy with the solution? Or what's your, your goal? So if it's rip and replace, right? They have a competitor in place and you're trying to talk about that. You probably know that A, your timing is wrong. So there's no reason to pretend it's not. B, you already know there's a switching cost. Like in anything, right? If you're using something and you want to change, there's a switching cost to that. We said, let's not, let's not sound uninformed to our buyers. We're aware of that. And as well, you know that even if they, even if they had a problem with their current provider, yeah. it's very rare that they're like, oh, and I'm looking for alternatives, right? That's very rare. Yeah. We have to embrace that. So what we're looking to do is, is acknowledge those things. Hey, I know paychecks is a good tool. I know this is what they cost. I know this is what it's like for year end. What's your experience? So you're trying to see, do they have a problem with it? Are they happy with it? And then you go straight into, not, look, I know my timing is off. I'd imagine you're not looking to switch right now. When, when does your contract renew with paychecks? Typically, that's when people want to have this conversation. And so again, you're giving them back the microphone and you're letting them speak and you're sounding informed every time you speak. And, and, and people respond to that so well. On the flip side, you might be selling a product that they don't have today or doesn't necessarily replace something. So at that point, you want to delve into that problem. So for example, at, at Full Story, one of the companies I sold for, nobody, most of the companies you spoke to didn't have a session replay tool. It okay. was very odd. Yeah. So we would say a lot of them use Google Analytics though to track user behavior on the website. But Google Analytics only shows you metrics. It doesn't actually show you what happened. So we would tell people, have you ever been on a website where you found yourself clicking or slamming your mouse in frustration because the UI was so bad? You're like, yeah, yeah, I've had that happen. We call that a rage click at full story. And I was curious, how do you know if people are rage clicking on your site today? That's a broad question. So, and what will be in this example, what will be your problem statement uh, before asking that? So the problem statement is uh, we talk about these rage click. We call that a rage click. So it's like, that's the problem. People, people are getting frustrated on your website and you might not be aware. So how do you see that today? And they'd be like, well, no, we track, we track in Google Analytics this. And I'd be like, right. So does Google Analytics allow you to see the rage click when somebody's actually um, getting frustrated with the UI? And they'd be like, no, actually, I don't think it does that, right? So now we're putting this, planting the seed in their head of a potential problem. 
So that, yeah. that that's kind of the, if I know they have a tool in place, I'm going to respect that. Like, you're not going to just switch because I cold called you randomly. And I'm probably not going to just sell you on this call to like buy a new tool. So let me just understand if you have a problem with it and when this becomes more relevant time-wise versus, okay, you don't have anything in place today. Have you ever thought about why that might be a problem? Have you ever considered the Im impact, the implications of not being able to see user behavior on your website? So that's, that's like, give you, so I said, it's like, it's like a framework. Yeah. It's not a script. So you still have to apply it to yours, to your buyer and the situation that you sell in. But we're doing the same thing, regardless of whether it's this or that. We're, we're finding ways to navigate the four transitions in a cold call and we're getting dialogue started. That's the biggest thing, right? We want to get away from pitching because pitching invites objections, but problem statements typically don't. It's a lot harder to say I'm not interested to a problem than it is to a pitch. The way I'm thinking about pitching versus talking about problems is pitching, you are talking about more when is it the right time to, to buy this solution. And when you focus on the problem, you can talk to a larger audience because the problem can be focused on a lot of more people than just buying the solution at, at that point. Exactly. And we, and we talked about that going full circle to where we started, which is about making progress. I'm very happy with good follow-ups. Good follow-ups are as good as a meeting set because outbound is a game of compounding activity. The more I do, the more reward I typically reap later on. So oftentimes you're calling right person, right company, wrong time. Exactly. So why not embrace that instead of resist? Go with that, but find people who are problem aware or want to become problem aware and just get the timing right. Say, hey, you know what? I already know. You don't have to tell me, Elric. I already know. My timing's probably off. I I'm sure you're not um, coming up on your paychecks renewal just yet. When, when is that? Out of curiosity. And now I'm just solving for that final piece, which is the timing. So when I call you back in three months time, it's going to be much, much better. And now that you're talking about album, for timing specifically for album, I have a lot of, when I used to work, uh, so for, for the audience that doesn't know, I used to work at Chili Piper. And when I was on SDR there, I um, had like, at least I know, remember four or five uh, deals that I booked outbound, they got like maybe two or three demos before making the decision on buying Chili Piper. And obviously the timing here, it's the example, but having outbound is always, it's more about education. And like you were mentioning about timing, because even though you had them on the demo, sometimes they won't make a decision, but then when it's the right timing, they will make the decision. Exactly. And, and you work that to your advantage as a seller, as a cold caller, Again, that helps you lower the expectations. It's like, I'm not trying to set meetings per se. If I set some meetings, great, but it's not my only goal. My real goal is how do I find people who are problem aware or want to become problem aware? If I do that, I'll get meetings. It might not be today. It might be in the follow-up, but I will get meetings with them. Now you're on the um, third part of the call call. So we are talking about provoking. So when do, when do you stop? When do you see there is a problem? For example, what do you do? Now that we're at the, the provoke part, we're entering that one to eight minutes of back and forth. And the thing I advise people to do is now don't, don't grab the microphone back and hog it. Right? You finally got the microphone into their hands. Be curious. Try to understand. Start asking your qualification question. How many employees do you have? What do you guys currently use today, et cetera? And then be the one to lean back. So this is the promise part. Hey, I mentioned at the beginning of the call, I know I was an interruption. I don't want to take too much more of your time. When works to set a meeting? When works to discuss this properly? Do you have 20 minutes, 30 minutes, the next couple of days to actually talk about something? There's so much power in you as the seller being the one to lean back. And, and pull away from the conversation and make them go, well, wait a second, you know, like, oh, well, so tell me more about what you guys do. And now they're inviting you to pitch, right? They're inviting you back into the conversation. So I, I really like that idea of a seller pulling back, of being the one to step out, of being like, hey, I do this all the time. 
So let's go ahead and set 20, 30 minutes in the next few days and we can talk about this properly. It seems like this might be of interest to you. When would that, when would work for that? And being the one to lean back. So there's, uh, and there's a lot of psychology behind it. I won't get into too much of the psychology, but, um, it's the, the point is from start to finish, you have done things that the buyer did not expect. The permission based opener, they don't expect that. The problem statement instead of a pitch, they don't expect that. This dialogue that you started them uh, in, they didn't expect that. And now all of a sudden you're doing the final unexpected thing. You're the one being like, hey, I'm done. I'm good. I I I'm ready to get off this call. How what do you what do you say? And they're like, wait, <laughs> that's my job. I'm supposed to do that usually. I think here what you are doing also is creating curiosity about what you do. Uh, and that's why they want to, to have this conversation. That's uh, the first thing. And the second thing also, it's you are doing the opposite on what generally uh, sales reps are doing. Calling, for that call calling, uh, sometimes they, are, they use a the permission-based opener, but then they pitch. And then they are doing exactly what other reps are doing. So you are, and here specifically, you are doing the total opposite. That's exactly it. it and when you break the pattern that way, it, it, it's phenomenal. I've been teaching the mic drop method now for three years. Over that time, over 5,000 sellers have used it. And the feedback's crazy. Like all of them are like, my talk time goes up. My confidence level is so much higher. Um, I'm not hearing, I'm not interested almost at all, you know, and so on and so forth. It's like, it makes sense. Why? Because like you said, all these other sellers are just calling and pitching, calling and pitching. And all of a sudden you're coming in with this like thoughtful, well-researched statement. And people are just like, wait, what? You know, like, <laughs> That's, that's actually, that's not bad. Yeah. Okay. We can talk about that. Like I actually do care about that. And, and it, you, you know, that's why it, it's, it feels more engaging from the buyer side to have a conversation with somebody. You're like, they, I guess this person knows what they're talking about. They seem to be pretty informed. And that's why it's relevant because generally a pitch is not relevant because here you are more focused on their pains and not just pitching uh, about something that they, they might not use. So. What's the biggest objection that you, you get uh, using this framework generally? The bulk of the work is figuring out the problem statement. You won't get objections almost at all if you get the problem statement right, but the time it takes you to find the problem statement is not a, you know, instant, you know, take a pill and you know, you've got your problem statement. It, it takes work. It, like I'll tell you right now, every time we've done this, I've, I've implemented this cold calling framework, it takes several attempts, you know, your first attempt is probably not going to be right. And you have to dial in. And, and the excuse that sellers use, like, Bilad, my, my product is too complicated to boil down to one problem statement. Bilad, we, we have too many, we have too many features. Like, how, where do I start? I'm like, that's, that's your job. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's not your, it's not your buyer's job to listen through three different selling propositions. It's your job to figure out which one should be relevant to them, right? They're not professional phone answerers. You're the professional caller. So it's your job to boil that down to something simple. A lot of people will try to cheat and use what I call the pain menu. You maybe heard this of like, oh, I, you know, I, a, a lot of, a lot of CFOs I speak to have these problems. You got one, two, three, which one is your problem, Elric? It's like, it's not my job to listen to your three options and pick one. You're calling me, you know, like you gotta be sharper than that. Uh, and, and, and it's very easy to say, I'm not interested to that. So I'm not interested, I'd argue is, is the crux of the problem. The number one objection, I think every cold caller faces, I'm not interested. And when you really look at it, it's not an objection, it's the truth. What you're saying is not interesting. So find something that is interesting. And, and that's what the mic drop method pushes you to do. Find that one problem statement that's short, concise, and makes people go, yeah, okay. Well, so what do you do? And do you think the, what you just mentioned, the, the three pains that they are giving, uh, do you think that's the biggest mistake you're making reps on, on cold calls? Yeah, I, the pain menu doesn't work. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry to say, I, I've seen enough cold calls now to know that that's not, really in an effective pitch. It, again, I, I'm sitting, imagine your buyer, right? I'm sitting there, call comes in, unknown number, I answer. And all of a sudden within 30 seconds, I'm listening to this pain menu. 
And it's like, I didn't, I didn't sign up for this. I, I just, I don't, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. this isn't interesting. It, it's so easy to say, I'm not interested to that. You can, you can see why people say that it, it's, it's long. It's uninformed. It's usually, and oftentimes it's a, it's, it's really broad. It's like, oh, you know, organizational transformation and, you know, economic headwinds. And you're like, what, what does this mean? Like, it's too, that's too boring and generic. I can't work with that. So last question for you, for the reps who are listening. So as the ROA is that listening today, what's your number one tip for someone who wants to improve in code coding? Take a piece of paper and write down five seconds, 20 seconds, one to eight minutes and close and start like chicken scratch, like literally mark on a piece of paper where you're losing your calls. The biggest, the biggest way you can improve your cold call, if you want to be really an elite cold caller, you want to get to that level, is self-diagnosis. You don't need a manager. You don't need a call recording tool. You don't, you don't need any of that. You just need to look and see where am I losing people? Am I losing people in the first five seconds? Okay, then maybe I need to stand up. Maybe I need to take a break. Maybe I need to, you know, change my tone, change my mentality. The next 20 seconds, well, maybe I need to change my problem statement, my provoke question. I need to think about what I could say that could be more interesting. And so like you, and you can diagnose yourself. I even, I made a free worksheet for it. If your viewers want to check it out, but you don't need my worksheet. My worksheet just gives you a way to do this easier, but I would tell every seller that if you want to get good at cold calling, you, if you need to get good at cold calling, and I would say every seller needs to have this skill because elite sellers know how to self-source pipeline. They don't rely on marketing. They don't rely on others. They do it themselves. I've, it's been that way for me in my whole career. And I think a lot of the success I've had came from the fact that I could just pick up the phone and call. I don't need anybody's permission or help to do that. So that's what I would say is get good at self-diagnosing, figure out where your calls are dropping, and that gives you an idea of what you need to change. Thank you so much uh, to be on the show today. But before we end the episode, I uh, would love to, to know if you can give more details around uh, your course or so, uh, because I know um, you just started to for your, your course like two months ago, something like that. I officially launched the mic drop course for those that are interested. If you go to go.learntosell, Dot io so go dot learn to sell dot io i've got the the free worksheet you can you can take and i provide a seven day free mini course so i'll give you seven days of little lessons on how to use the worksheet and slowly improve your cold call game and if you think it's valuable then i'll give you an offer at the end of it to buy the course which you can choose to or not but i definitely recommend checking it out like i said i've had over five thousand sellers use that worksheet I've refined it over time from their feedback. It's pretty dialed in. So I recommend it for everybody to check out. It will help you with the diagnosis and kind of thinking about how you make your transitions in your cold call. On my side, I was using your watch when I was at Chili Piper. So it was really helpful to, to improve my cold calling. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Did it work? Yeah. How was it? No, it, it worked. Um, I still need to, uh, to improve it, but I think the I really enjoy the focus on the problem statement more than pitching. So that's really resonates with me, the way I'm thinking about conquering. So Right on. Love it. Bill, thank you so much for being on the show today. And for everyone listening, I'll see you on the next episode. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, feel free to leave a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. So for Spotify, to leave a review, what you can do is you can use your phone, then go on the Spotify app, then you go to the SDR game page, and then at the top of the page, you can leave um, a review. Uh, it's a, a five-star review uh, if you enjoyed the episode, obviously. And then if you are listening to this episode on Apple Podcasts, feel free also to leave a review uh, on your app. Thanks for listening, and I see you on the next episode.